Hey, good morning. Uh, good morning. We'll That's be covering good. the subject of origin of the texts, particularly for the New Testament, which would be in Greek, and textual criticism. All right, so the lineage of the New Testament. Last week, in case you guys can figure out, we were covering uh, what the Old Testament came from, or where, rather. So it was just the lineage of that. So now we're covering over for the New Testament. Now, just to review, we are basically going in a series. This is why we use the King James Bible. We believe it's because the not just the Old Text, the Old Testament text, but also the New Testament text is preserved. And the argument basically is not so much with the Old Testament um, as it is really from the fact that the New Testament portion is argued. And so this is really where, I guess, most of the contention comes around as far as why most other translations are viewed as being, I guess, off because of a lot of what we're going to review today. Uh, it's not so much also, which we will cover somewhat uh, a little bit today if we haven't already, and we will next week as well uh, as far as uh, translation philosophy uh, with regard to trying to distinguish between uh, dynamic equivalence and formal equivalence. Uh, in other words, either trying to go as, as close to word for word as possible or as just giving uh, what would be the thought uh, behind it rather than actually just trying to transmit the word itself into the receptor language. But we are looking at uh, today, again, uh, lineage of the New Testament, and that's usually that's going to be the big the big point of contention. Um, and in case most people don't know, <laughs> as far as uh, in the English language, uh, the only translation that is done as far as the New Testament portion from what would be considered the received family of manuscripts is still the King James. So. Um, as far as pretty much every other one uh, in English is done from what would be considered the uh, minority text or the critical text. Uh, or they combine critical text with portions of the majority text, but nevertheless it's still uh, the only one that would use, as far as this New Testament portion, the received family of manuscripts, so the received text. And so, well, let's get started. Okay, so origin of the text, textual criticism, lineage of the New Testament. Uh, <laughs> all right, some people do take it too far, and uh, this was, okay, I guess it's not coming up. So I gotta go do it like that then. All right, there we go. Uh, there's, this is a barbershop off of Atlantic, close to Federal, in Pompano, and uh, <laughs> That gets you straight there. Actually, now what it is is uh, you can go a little bit too far and over the board with regard to uh, just being King James only. But the fact is that okay. we use it because it's for the received family of manuscripts. If somebody were to this day and age take your received family of manuscript Greek New Testament and do translation into English, it it'd be just as acceptable. Now, granted, you wouldn't have the uh, you know the same committee of like the scholars that they did back then. But even in Greek class, when uh, we, we took Greek in, in college, and that's basically what we did. We sat in class and uh, translated. So that would be just as valid. Okay, so original autographs dating basically from 40 A.D. to about 100 A.D. is roughly the time frame of when you have your Gospels. Uh, you have Paul's writings, you have uh, Apostle John doing his writings and the other and the others that were written, and the latest being uh, Revelation. So of the original autographs, just so we know, uh, that might be a little bit hard to read, it says, okay, no surviving complete manuscripts. Uh, we have nothing that you can point back to and say that, okay, this was the actual physical copy that was handwritten out by Apostle Paul, or that was handwritten out by uh, Apostle John, or that was handwritten out by Peter, or by James, or any of the other uh, writers of the New Testament, um, by Luke. Uh, we don't actually have a physical hand copy of anything that was written out by them that survived. Now, there might be portions, 
that date back close to it, and there's a number of reasons for that. One, it's um, common sense. Okay, if you use something quite frequently, it's going to deteriorate. It's going to get worn. Now, most of what they did back then uh, with regard to transmitting is would have been the same as what they would have carried on from with the old, which was they actually physically hand wrote on scrolls, uh, which would have been primarily animal skin. They would have been leather. Okay, and so if you use it enough, it's going to you'll get worn out, okay? Uh, two is um, the fact that when something does get worn, then they would, now they didn't have the same, even though they were primarily Jewish as far as the writers of the New Testament with the exception of Luke, uh, who would have been probably a Jewish proselyte, but he wouldn't have been Jewish uh, ethnically. Uh, so they would have probably carried on the same tradition as far as with, as how the old uh, writers would, when they uh, retire a manuscript, and that would be that they would just bury it. Okay. Uh, also, you got to take into consideration the fact of, though we do have some, is that at times there was persecution and purging, and though there would be instances in recorded history of uh, <coughs> Roman kings and leadership that would try and purge or rid Christianity uh, within the kingdom, uh, with, within their empire, uh, and some of that would constitute, they would go and not just kill believers, but they would try and get, obviously, whatever they would have and just burn it. And so you have things of that nature that would take place, but you do have uh, portions of close to what would be, or closest to what would be the original, and you can reconstruct, or what has what they have done is that they've reconstructed basically from quotations from the early church writings and then from fragments of what they found. Um, hey, Charlie. Yes. One of the things that's important to point out is it's interesting in Old Testament text transmission that the system that the that the Jews had of of their scribes and uh, of their their copyists was a good way of, of uh, the preservation of the Scripture. But in the New Testament, the proliferation of the Scripture is one of the great things about, about how that the Scripture was preserved literally. Today, they're in from like around 200 A.D., like literally 200 years, uh, well, not even 200 years, 150 to 200 A.D., there are copies of the Scripture today, lots of them, not, not complete copies, as in, you know, they're, they're worn, they're tattered, but thousands upon thousands of copies of the Scripture still existing today. And what that points to is the proliferation of the text. In other words, there wasn't built around it like the rabbinical system had, the protection of the manuscript in, in copying, but what there was was the proliferation. I mean, just thousands of copies got out. And so when you had thousands of copies, if somebody made one mistake or one error uh, in transcribing the scripture, I mean, you, you know, if you say you have a thousand of them, there's 999 other ones that show what the word ought to be. And so there's never been any question about the exact actual words that belonged in the text until the last, say, uh, 200 years. Let, Literally within the last couple of hundred years is when all the attacks and where people are saying, hey, you know, they're, you know, anyway, I know we'll get into the science of textual criticism, but it's important to recognize that proliferation was the means to preservation in the in the New Testament manuscript. So the idea that, well, they didn't have, you know, they didn't have rabbis that took a bath every time they wrote Jehovah's name. No, they just had a thousand people making copies and going around, and they and they had those copies in the regions all around the world. So you could you could go down into Africa and you could go up into uh, you know you could go into Alexandria you could go all the different places and actually find copies that agreed exactly and so you could have a persecution in a region of the world but they couldn't they couldn't do it everywhere at the same time and so the word of God just got out. Yeah. Well, part of that also is because of the fact that they weren't strict. It wasn't uh, confined strictly Israel. In other words, <laughs> the church. The church and Israel are distinct, and uh, that's God's intended portion. And so, though the church started in Israel and it was primarily Israeli, um, 
it wasn't limited to. And so that's um, they they wouldn't they wouldn't have had they would have maybe you know carried some of the concepts or whatever, but they wouldn't have had the same restrictive uh, nature of format as far as like having the the mass rights and such. But, uh, wait a minute. Back. All right, so here, original autographs dating. We don't have any copies. Now, mind you, um, is already kind of jumping ahead pretty quick. Some pre-80, 450 manuscripts survived because of corruption and no use, and then same thing. We have two primary uh, families of corruption uh, beyond just what you might have found on occasion. Uh, within uh, Middle East region, and that is you would have from Alexandria, uh, which at the time, well, we'll go into that. Uh, Alexandria was like a hub or a hotbed for uh, basically for apostasy. Apostasy, yeah. <laughs> uh, with origin, and then um, with the school that he ran there, and then with the Western text, that would have been primarily because of the Catholic Church, or. Well, yeah, it's called, for lack of a better term, the Catholic Church, the Catholic cult. Um, so they would be, now mind you, if you really want to argue this, you could go back even to the garden. Uh, when God gave his word, then you would have Satan uh, come and try and deceive Eve, which he ended up doing, but then he attacks by saying, yea, hath God said. So all along throughout the history of God having given his, uh, transmitted his word, given his word to people, you would have along with that uh, Satan or his minions basically bringing about perversion. And um, even in the law you have, particularly in Exodus 18, where they're given how to test for a false prophet. And so Israel had issued that uh, they were going to be confronted with false prophets, and that is that you would have folks that would come and say, you know, this is a message from God, uh, and it was to lead people astray and lead them away from God's path. And so, um, just because there was an instance of that doesn't mean that <laughs> God's word would be destroyed or that He would preserve it uh, faithfully for us. Okay, so you have origin, uh, the Vaticanus and Sinaiticus, Alexandria city, and Gnosticism. Now, mind you, Gnosticism is the concept or the idea that there's a special knowledge, there's this hidden knowledge, there's this extra um, knowledge that's out there that is only specifically reserved for certain special people and such. Um, and it also has the idea that uh, matter is evil, but the spirit is good. And so because of that, they would say that Jesus had a human body and human flesh is evil, therefore Jesus had to have had evil in him, he couldn't have been the son of God. Okay, so they, they deny Christ's deity uh, in that, because of that. Uh, you have, uh, there's a catechal school in Alexandria founded by Pantaneus, who was a Gnostic, and then later you have a, a gentleman by the name of Clement, who was heavily influenced by Pantaneus, and then this became the center for Greek philosophy and science. Uh, and then he would succeed Pantaneus uh, he had a school, and then there was a gentleman by the name of Origen, uh, which would have lived around 232 A.D. Uh, he, by the way, Origen is also kind of responsible for... Um, he kind of says what the Jehovah's Witnesses say now. Right. Yes, in large degree, yeah. But he wouldn't have been, he would have been more, he would, he would have been the originator of uh, Calvinism. Well, Satan is really, but I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> They, everybody, everybody, if you, if historically, as far as you trace it back, Calvinism really got to start with Origen and the Gnostics. And then from there, later on, Augustine would expound on it, and then later on down, and then during the Reformation, you have John Calvin heavily influenced by Augustine's uh, writings and such, and then it just kind of continues on until today. Uh, but Origen really would have been the, 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 I guess, the founder of it, if you want to you call it that. So here's some of what he taught. He taught infant baptism, universalism, which is uh, the idea that you know there's no going to hell. 
everybody's going to be saved. God's going to rescue everybody, uh, including demons would eventually be saved. Okay, an allegoric interpretation of scripture. Okay, so you don't take it literally, grammatically, historically. You just take it to mean what you think it says, not what it actually really does say. Uh, and then you find it's more of a subjective approach with the allegoric. In other words, you see it and whatever it kind of has application to you, uh, but it doesn't really mean what it says. And then purgatory. He would have been the first one that would have taught uh, purgatory. And origin freely acknowledged uh, volitional alterations of the scriptures. In other words, he went ahead and he would take scripture and just amend it to whatever he felt should, it should be. So he would have no issue whatsoever with going ahead and taking God's word and just modifying it to his particular belief system. And he, he freely admitted that. Okay, his influence is believed to have uh, been uh, be, um, being, been the beginning of Arianism, okay, denying the deity of Christ. Okay, first to include the Apocrypha, which are a series of books that we have that, uh, if you look at any older, beyond, uh, older than the King James, like you look at your Coverdale, even your Wycliffe, uh, you look at... Dewey Reigns. Well, well, yeah, Dewey Reigns, but Dewey Reigns is uh, based off the Vulgate rather than actually the Greek. So they wouldn't have, um, though they would have consulted. Go ahead. You want to read that uh, that, that source that was on that, uh, that the, by Jack Mormon, was it Forever Sealed? I would uh, recommend if you're looking, because a lot of people ask me the question, where did the idea of purgatory come from? Where did, uh, you know, a lot of things you mentioned, infant baptism and stuff, where did that originate? And he's got some great sources there. You know, not everybody's going to go to Europe and dig up all the uh, Greek manuscripts or, or uh, Latin manuscripts, but that, I, I recommend that book by Jack Mormon. Okay, it's um, Forever Settled, A Survey of the Documents and History of the Bible, uh, published in... Bible for Today, 1997. Actually, it's uh, privately printed in 85, but it's a reprint. Yeah, but you can get it through uh, Bible for Today. And then... Um, and it's, it's, there's nine in stock on Amazon right now, I'm looking at. So it'd be an easy one to pick up. Then the Touch Not the Unclean Thing is also another source that's listed here for uh, David Sorensen. And you can get his on... Well, you can just do a, a quick Google search for that. Scurcy's one. Uh, Eusebius succeeded Origen and was the only, excuse me, was the one who argued for Arius, Arianism, which is basically denying the deity of Christ, saying, okay, because he's human, he had human body, he can't be God, because we know that matter is evil, uh, but spirit is good. All right, so he uh, argued against Athanasius at the Council of Nicaea in AD 325, and then Constantine ordered Eusebius to c provide uh, 50 manuscripts for the churches in Constantinople. Uh, and then Tischendorf, who is a German theologian, uh, Sinaiticus was one of these. Uh, Sinaiticus being a manuscript, uh, manuscript family found in Sinai region, uh, which between basically Arabia, Saudi Arabia, and Egypt. Okay, conclusion is not Prove that these are the exact copies Constantine ordered from this heretic, but it is certain that they were derived from the same source. All right, so the idea is that you have Constantine taking manuscripts or having requested manuscripts, and so he gets them from a poor source. So then now you have replication of these bad manuscripts going around. Okay, Alexandrian texts. Okay, from Egypt and North Africa, shorter than the traditional text, contain much heresy related to Arianism, which attack on the deity of Christ. And then all English translation, except for obviously the King James and the New King James, are out of these texts. Uh, critical texts are what would be the eclectic text. Now it's called eclectic, so we know, um, which we'll get into a little bit over here further on, but just to just jump on is that prior to 1881, um, what is considered the eclectic text was didn't like exist, right? So in other words, what they took was they took 
the manuscripts that were found in Alexandria in Sinai, they would have taken the one found in the Vatican, which would have been a Western text. Um, but these were basically not in circulation. They were kind of hidden, they were kind of kept. And the two gentlemen that were responsible, not only just for finding them, but also just kind of compiling and making what would be considered the eclectic text, is that they took bits and pieces of the Sinai Alexandrian text, and then they took bits and pieces of what would of what was the Western text, the Vatican one, and then they basically made a new text out of it. In, order, in the form that it, it was that they created in 1881, it did not originally exist. So what they did was they took bits and pieces of this, okay, I like this here, I like this there, I'll refrain from adding this or that because I don't think it's that good. And then they took this and then they said, okay, well, what we'll do is we'll go ahead and we'll um, add bits and pieces from here of what we like uh, and then put that all together and boom, okay, now we have a new manuscript. So prior to 1881, what would be considered the eclectic text did not exist in its form because you only have what would be the perverted text that was coming out of Alexandria, the one that was found preserved in, in the Vatican, and you would have had the family of received manuscripts that would have been in Palestine or whatever, the Holy Land. So prior to that, you wouldn't have had that existing. But anyway, so the critical text is the foundation for every other English translation with the exception of the New King James, but the New King James takes the, go ahead. We you probably should qualify that by saying every common or every you know published, because for instance, I don't believe Noah Webster's, uh, I don't believe Noah Webster's Bible uh, used critical apparatus, um, and there will be a few other ones. There are maybe about ten different translations that just never were. Oh yeah, okay. Marketed as others. Yeah, yes. Words, they're, okay. not, they're not. They're not. They're uh, not. They can use text the textual criticism. So anyway. Okay. Yes. yes. Austrian statement there, all English translations except KJV and NKJV are out of these texts. So the NKJV is claims to be from the received text, but they use a lot of the wording from the critical text, the eclectic text. They consulted. Yeah. They, but, they but picked and choose. In other words, what they but did they was... they used it. Yeah. Is it, it was used, but it wasn't entirely. Right. But, I mean... So, so you could say it's just a, a watered-down usage of the eclectic text. I mean, I would say it's a usage of the eclectic text. Um, okay. You know, just because it doesn't use it as much doesn't mean it doesn't use it. True. No, thank you. Yeah, sure. <laughs> okay. So you have your traditional text, which would have been from Byzantine. Uh, Considered the majority because that's what the majority of the manuscripts that you would have had historically to be found would have been, and they would have all uh, agreed pretty much with each other. Now, mind you, when you find the manuscripts, um, your Bible itself is 66 books, all right? So then you got 39 old, 27 new, and of the 27 new, um, they weren't organizing them necessarily as what we would like in a codex. Okay, they're scrolls. Okay, so you would have the scroll of the letter written to Corinth. Okay, or the second one to Corinth, and then you would have the other one to, you know, Peter, the the journal, the journal epistle, or the the one to the Hebrews, and such. Okay, so they weren't all like compiled into one, just like easily formatted thing of what we would have or what we would read. Well, we'd get that later. But I'm, I'm just saying, they didn't, you would have, okay, this scroll, this scroll, this scroll, this scroll, and such. And so what you have transmitted around is those. And so you have, okay, so the letter to the church at Corinth, the first one or the second one, uh, as far as the ones that are inspired. <laughs> let, me, let me clarify, because there's more than, there's more than just those two that were written to Corinth, but as far as the ones that are actually inspired scripture, would have been the, the two that we have preserved. Uh, so those were circulated around 
not just to Corinth in particular, but also to the other churches. And as, you know, when Peter wrote, then that, that would be circulated around. So you get multiple copies of that and multiple copies of this. And so you have uh, of, the, of what would be the, the manuscripts that were, that were found that would be preserved. Okay, we have however many of Peter, or however many of uh, the one at Corinth, or however many to, uh, of James or, and such. Okay, so we have, and that, that's considered the, the, the received family. Uh, what we have now in history, 1400s, you have the Waldensians, which would have been followers of Peter Waldo, which eventually settled in northern Italy, and they would have been considered Anabaptists, in other words, they would have been considered rebaptizers. Uh, so they would have been a part of the, the church, they would have been believers. Uh, come come to Christ, and then they just tried to follow uh, the scripture as closely as possible. They would be persecuted because by this time already you have Catholic Church uh, being primarily governing in most of Europe, and then they, if you were not under Catholic um, submission, I guess you would be persecuted, you'd be killed off, so then they go off, hide off in the mountains and caves and such, and then eventually you'd have a large contingent that would come over here as far as the ones that would be killed off. But they would have in italic, northern italic particular, that they would have a translation that they would use. And that would be from, okay, you receive family uh, manuscripts. Okay, Calvin and Luther's translation. Calvin did one. Uh, Luther, obviously, uh, which is still in, actually in use today, um, would have done one, and he did one from what would have been the received family and manuscripts. Actually, most of your, actually all of them, all of your Reformation translations that came about after the fact. Now mind you, prior to the Reformation you would have, I mean you still had groups that were around. You had uh, the, you had, a, you had a translation into Aramaic, and then you had also a translation that would be done into Syriac. Or, uh, I think it's called the Peshitta. Uh, so, Within, uh, I guess, what we consider Holy Land in uh, Israel and, and uh, surrounding region, the believers that were there, okay, they didn't speak, maybe not all entirely Hebrew, but then you would have a host of Greek. So they would have, okay, say the ones that spoke Syriac or the ones that spoke Aramaic. Uh, and for whatever reason, they can either learn uh, Hebrew, they couldn't learn Greek, uh, or didn't have enough of grasp of it, so what they would do is they would just take the word and then it was translated, so then now you would have it in your own language. Um, and so that's all these folks were doing. They said, okay, we need to have the word of God available to us and to those that are here that either for whatever reason don't have the facility or ability to be able to go ahead and learn uh, Greek and Hebrew. <laughs> so, you know, God made provision for that. And so you have, historically, the translation that were coming about out of there. Uh, Diodati did his, and, in Italian, uh, there's a there's a priest by the name of uh, Almeida that did one in Portuguese, uh, and then you had two two fellows that did theirs primarily into Spanish. Uh, so a lot of these preceded uh, the King James, obviously, and a lot of these guys actually were killed and persecuted uh, by the Catholic Church for for doing so. Uh, oh, Almeida wasn't a particular well; he was somewhat, but he he he, he was able to flee to complete his. All right, so now you have also Greek text editions. Now this is speaking of where you have now into this codex format as opposed to just being from a scroll. So now you have uh, with the coming about of the printing press, you have a facility now to be able to go ahead and take uh, material which normally would be transmitted by handwriting because we didn't have Xerox to now make multiple copies a lot quicker and uh, a lot easier uh, to be able to go ahead and take it from what would be now a handwritten copy to actually now okay, this is a, a streamlined uh, book formatted copy. And so now that, that's where you start having these come about 1516. In May, uh, Erasmus uh, printed first as Greek edition of the New Testament, 1550 Stephanus, and then 1598 uh, Theodore Beza and then the Elzebra brothers uh, 1633, uh, which, now these are all editions of your received family from your Byzantine uh, family of received manuscripts, okay? Uh, and what they did was they, they did, 
they were the ones that okay primarily headed up and said okay we looked at the different manuscripts that we have available to us compiled them and then now formatted it so that we can and made a printing and so they were the ones that were primarily held that were responsible for for these printings um, and then the English translations that would come from that uh, historically okay 1526 you have Willem Tyndale after that, following him, you have Coverdale, and then the Great Bible, the Geneva Bible, and then the Bishop's Bible, and then ultimately 1611, which had multiple revisions following, uh, would be the King James. Okay, so of the Western texts, uh, Latin texts, and Roman Catholic Bible. All right, so what this is, is that you have Jerome, is a gentleman that would have taken the manuscripts and then translated them into Latin because that was the main language in which the Roman Catholic Church operated in. And not only that, but also, even though they had their own languages in the regions that they were ruling, uh, they used it as kind of like a formal language to be able to go ahead and to rule. Uh, so that's what he did. He just took it and then um, he translated it. He said, uh, contained many additions over traditional texts and Alexandrian texts. And also had deletions from traditional texts, uh, Western omissions, atonement, ascension. And also what he did was he manipulated it some. So he didn't have any issue with as far as adjusting what he liked or didn't like uh, within the text itself as far as when he did his, his translation or his revision. Okay, textual criticism. Now this is the concept or the idea that if you're looking for the Word of God, how do you evaluate? Like, is there some kind of method? Is there some kind of way to be able to determine as far as, okay, how do I know I have the Word of God? So that, that's, that's the concept of the idea. It would start primarily, well, it wouldn't start, but it would start with the Germans, but it was during what would be considered the age of rationalism, and it followed what would be the Dark Ages into what would be the Age of Enlightenment and what would be the Reformation. Okay, and that is that for how many hundreds of years you have the Catholic Church wanted to keep everybody in ignorance and they wanted to rule over everybody, uh, lord over everybody, uh, because they wanted control, they wanted your money, they didn't really care about them. <laughs> they weren't really concerned as far as spiritual things. Uh, so then now you have people that are rejecting as a, con as a result of that, uh, just religion altogether. They're sitting there questioning everything. Uh, you have a lot of scientific advancements that are taking place, and so they're approaching everything from the perspective or the aspect that says, okay, well, we can't really rest upon what was traditionally taught us, so we're gonna reject all that, and then we're gonna take it on the basis of what we can evaluate scientifically. And as you know, science deals primarily with what is testable, what is limited to our five senses, okay, what you can taste, feel, see, touch, are, um, and those kinds of things. So it's, it, it really kind of uh, doesn't account or leave room or space for what would be outside of the natural, okay. Anyway, so then you have a gentleman by the friend, uh, Friedrich Constantine von Tischendorf, okay, a German rationalist critic who began search for old manuscripts on the assumption that the original form and currently used of the New Testament had been lost. And that is basically the foundation or the concept upon which any textual criticism is going to take place is that, okay, we don't really have it, so we go looking for it. And so we can't really trust what we've already been handed down, what has been time tested, uh, what has been proven. Uh, so we reject that altogether in favor of something new, something different. Okay, so he discovered. Sinaiticus at a Greek Orthodox convent in 1844. It was not allowed to read it because monks became suspicious, returned in 1853 to look at it again, but was not allowed. In 1856, returned and was again denied access. In 1862, returned and was allowed to take a look at, or to take back to Leipzig, Germany. In 1864, Scribner examined and found corrections from original writing from 6th or 7th century also had heard of Vaticanus, a text uh, Napoleon had taken to Paris as a prize, but later returned to the Vatican. It was, re uh, excuse me, it was returned in 1815 to the Vatican Library, and in 1843, a young Tischendorf was allowed to see it for six hours. 
1866, he was allowed three hours a day for 14 days to copy it. And in 1867, he produced a, uh, excuse me, the quote unquote, the most perfect copy of the manuscript uh, from his 42 hour session. <laughs> okay, um, which would have been a handwritten copy. Okay, so these texts had the same source, but different in the following. Okay, Vaticanus omits 2,877 words, adds 536 words, substitutes 935 words, and then transpose two of, two, excuse me, 2,098 words. Sinaiticus omits 3,455 words, adds 839 words, substitutes 1,114 words, and transposes 2,399 words and modifies 1,265 words. Okay, these are all disagreements uh, of these texts between each other. <coughs> and that is to say that you find beyond just what would be considered, okay, like maybe a spelling error, or copying error, or something of that nature, it would be basically, okay, I don't agree with what this is teaching. I don't agree with what this would be. I think this would be a better suitable substitute for, and so he goes ahead and changes on the basis. All right, so Westcott and Hoare, 1851, began collating the Sinaiticus and the Vaticanus. And then these men were into German rationalism, which basically denies inspiration and inerrancy, advocated the universal fatherhood of God, denied propitiation, okay, believed in evolution and denied uh, creation even before Darwin, believed the resurrection was spiritual, not physical, and then a universal salvation, and then denied the pre-existence of Christ. Okay, dating, weighing and counting. Uh, oldest texts are assumed to be better than those that are newer, and St. Anicus and Vinicanus are older. Now, that is because they figure that if it's older, then it would have been closer to what would be the original. Um, it does not take into account the fact that it would have, if it's older, then it probably wasn't very used. And then also the fact that it was kept in other words, they weren't widely circulated. Uh, all right, and then um, Wayne, designated importance of text. Uh, they discount received text because of recension, revisions, assumption that, okay, is that these texts were changed based on a decree by a church council problem. Okay, no church council documents any of these facts. Okay, Rescott and Hort refer to the TR as vile and uh, this is documented by Philip Schaff, and then Philip Schaff, uh, which would have been on the NASV committee, said, uh, NASV committee said that the Texas Receptus does not deserve the superstition and veneration in which it, it was held for nearly 300 years. Uh, and this is, now Philip Schaff also is a gentleman that wrote uh, on church history a lot. He's got like a, something like either 28 to 64 volumes of early church history. Uh, so he, he, he said, he's pretty thorough with documentation on things. Okay, come on. And then here, uh, a general introduction to the study of theology, exegetical, historical, systematic, practical, including encyclopedia, methodology, and bibliography, a manual for students, is where you would have gotten this from. Um, now, he holds it in disdain and he says of it, mind you, that it's been held in high esteem for over 300 years. Now, I know it seems silly to, to say this, but isn't that kind of pretty significant? Not so much that it's been held in high esteem, but the fact that they've been around for over 300 years. So you have evidence of the fact that it's been preserved. In other words, that we have it. And then the teachings would contain within the content hasn't really been modified and that we've had it. So his attack on it, beyond just Westcott and Horn and the others that have tried to include perversions, is that it's, you know, go ahead. Well, if you read Schaff or you read Westcott or you read Hort or even Kittle, they literally mock people that venerate the Word of God. And that, I think that's kind of the point of that quote. You know, the fact, I mean, 300 years, no, way more than that. You know, actually, that's way, that's that's not accurate. It's not an accurate statement. But the point of lifting that quote is to emphasize the fact that 
someone who believes that they are responsible for taking two conflicting texts, merging them together into what they believe would be ideal or the best text. And that, you know, that, that concept goes along with the very idea of mocking someone who believes that the Word of God is perfect and preserved. And so this is what we find in the scholarship. You know, you, you go into the average church and you've got people with NIV, NSV, ESV, uh, and so forth. And there are people that believe the Bible is the Word of God. And what they don't realize is that the people who gave them the book they're using literally would have the utmost disdain for them just for the idea that they believe that God is supernatural. What do you mean by the word venerate? Venerate means, well, the venerate <coughs> means worship the like an hour, just like a, hold it high esteem. It's something that like... Like, like look at our, look at our wall there, Psalm 138 too. Pray, I will uh, worship for thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and truth. For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. Okay, so they come in here and say, you're a bunch of nut jobs. You know, you think the Bible, you know, you think the Bible's like a supernatural book, a preserved book, you know, that God says he's going to magnify it above his own name. <laughs> you know, so, yeah, I mean, they think you're an idiot for it. And, and the real question, the second question is, too, German rationalism, what Westcott and Hort believed, could they have been Christian? If they believed in the universal fatherhood of God, they denied the, the no. deity of Christ, the virgin birth. No, could Oregon have been a Christian? Could he have been a believer? See, this is what we've gotten into, is we literally have got people who will consider themselves historians, and I think they're possessed by devils in many instances. What, what motivation can a person who doesn't believe in a supernatural God have to dedicate their life to religious books? Why would a person who doesn't believe in God want to handle the Word of God? Because they want to manipulate religion. That's why. They want to take away what they consider to be superstition and faith. Yeah, they, they want to stop people from believing in things like creation, literal creation. They want to stop people from believing in things like literal virgin birth, literal uh, resurrection, a literal God. And in, in, in many senses, right. they are way more effective than the atheists of their day yeah. because they're an atheist, but they... They literally, it is their religious zeal or their religious uh, aim, their goal, to eradicate a supernatural faith in people and veneration for God. That's evil. I mean, that's what's behind, you know, we, we look at the, well, you know, the, the person holding the SV doesn't believe that, but he's being manipulated by people who do. That's the point. I'll finish this uh, counting. Okay, so you have five thousand, roughly five thousand six hundred and fifty-six manuscripts that are extant, in other words, that are that we have either a portion of or in full um, as of 1994. In 1967, Kurt Anland, who would have been a gentleman that is also uh, responsible for a number of translations and also. Um, responsible for compiling and revising and editing uh, what would be the critical text or eclectic text uh, numerous times uh, notes that there of 5,255 New Testament manuscripts uh, you have 5,210 that support the TR okay so you have <laughs> 45 that don't <laughs> okay so in other words you have 5,255, and out of that, 5,210 support what you find in your received manuscript family. Okay, as far as, not mind you, this is New Testament. Um, so the critics, the ones that attack it, the ones that are responsible for pretty much anything new with regard to your uh, new translations that are found in English today. Well, actually, you know what, the funny thing is, it's, they're actually pretty responsible for a lot of the ones that are in, in multiple languages too. It's hard to find anybody from a received, not that they aren't around or not that they aren't out there, but it's hard to find somebody from a received position, received exposition, going out and actually doing uh, translation work. Um, 
Actually, it's hard to find anybody to see. Go ahead. What are the received uh, texts? Where did they come from? They would have been copies that would have been circulated among the churches. It and means the church has always believed it's the Word of God. Received text means, I mean, literally, it's textus receptus. And it literally means the church has always used these, these manuscripts. So received means they've been accepted by the church. Yeah. Well, okay, it, it, they're, con they're considered that, but the thing is, is they were the copies of manuscripts that were originally written by, uh, you know, Paul or by John or by Luke, by Matthew, uh, that were found in, I guess, what would be modern-day Palestine, what would be in the regions, in, you know, that would have been in, you would have found in Turkey, that you would have found in Jordan, that you would have found in Syria, that you would have found in Lebanon, that you would have found in Israel itself. Uh, so whenever... You know, John wrote, or whenever Peter wrote, whenever Paul wrote. Okay, the original that they wrote, they circulated around to the original recipient, and then those were copied and circulated around to other churches. And then, as the churches, you know, grew, as believers, uh, as more believers came into being, and then other churches started or whatever, so they got circulated around to them, and then they made copies. And so that's the, that's what that's the received family. In other words, that the copies that were made that were circulated around to the, to the believers. Uh, but now most of them were found in, in, in Byzantine, where would have, would have, you know, whatever Constantinople, it would have been in, in the eastern region, um, in, you know, whatever, Turkey and Lebanon and Syria and, and all, um, and, and Holy Land. And so that, the, the majority of the manuscripts are found there. You have the perverted manuscripts that would have been originating from Alexandria, and then you have, obviously, the ones that uh, Jerome, would have amended and then those preserved at the Vatican uh, and then you you also would have had if I mean if you look at the New Testament Paul writes of the fact that there are folks that are attacking him uh, in other words that he had he has to defend his apostleship not just because of the accusation of the church saying oh well where are you to rule over us but also the fact that you have unbelievers or you have folks that are trying to attack the word uh, the work of God through falsifying uh, material Saying that it's in his name, uh, so he even he even had that issue then, as far as people that were trying to um, forge or whatever, or say things that were against scripture uh, in his name to try and you know lead people astray. But the uh, to answer your question is basically the received manuscripts are the ones, the copies that are from you know originals. But so um, God made it abundantly clear what is the Word of God and what is not the Word of God. I mean, 99% of the manuscripts all agree and show what it was. Um, but that doesn't even, that, that is just the manuscripts. It doesn't even include all of the uh, documents that we have that other people wrote. You know, they were writing a letter to someone else and they included a portion of scripture in their letter and those portions also match the TR. Yes. The simple answer to this question is that the TR is the manuscript the church has always used until the 1800s. That's what it means. Received text means the text the church has received. And by church, we're not talking about the cult. We're talking about believers. Yeah. Many of whom were part of the of Catholicism. Next week, we're going to look. Does, well, does anybody have any questions? All right, next week we're going to look at the history of the English Bible. We did a quick review of it today, and we'll see. Tyndale was the primary one responsible, or in other words, the primary one that God used to go ahead and translate it for us. Uh, he wasn't the only one, um, as we'll see, but he was the one that was primarily responsible for getting it into the English language. All right, so no questions, we are dismissed.
goes. Oh, yeah. Yes, the critical text. Well, not old manuscripts. Not old manuscripts. But old paragraphs and always used. Not, not old as in manuscript, but old as in always used. So they have old manuscripts. Those 45 were mentioned there. But some of those are old. Oh, oh, yeah, physically, oh, oh, physically, oh, 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 but like Charlie said, that doesn't yeah. make them better because the text that is used is the good text, and it wears out. The text that isn't used is rejected, it wasn't used, and therefore it doesn't wear out. So you do have a whole lot of it doesn't make them better. <laughs> Yeah, it is. No, it is. No. <laughs> it's an origin of why the King James came about it. They wanted to see the extra notes out of it. They wanted a better translation. It's not the blue thing in the source for the same as really. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> as far as how they came about with it, because it was up until the King James, the only had what did they use? One or a handful of English guys. They used the Tyndale was the one. Even the King James translators, they used those, they used, which were in the almost ninety percent of Tyndale's work. Yeah. Like and he was just one man that spent a good part of his life. Translated. His work was actually pretty good. So he's in other words, when you say that we have 5,000 so many existing manuscripts there, Bibles that the people use, that's what it's talking about. And so they'd be like, if you were to get my Bible, uh, my Bible is not an accurate, complete manuscript. Yeah, yeah. that was team, team because I've got organized by. Uh, yeah. I have things missing in my Bible. Let me show you something. Yeah. So that's your contention. No, no, my, my contention makes it now is just the source material that they use. They use the, the, the received family of the English. Like Greek. So if you would take the manuscripts. If you would take all of the, the Bibles in here, or the re the received family of manuscripts for the Greek New Testament. Morning. 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 Because you the the whole thing the Wycliffe. Wycliffe was also Wycliffe. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. I can't start until. Realize that's me. They, um, you're going, but. No, the Catholics used somebody that had Joe's was. The whole thing was intact, and where they had that fragment. As far as I know, they would have been intact. I don't know if they were the Greeks. Why? Yeah. Um, I'm just curious. No, no, it's over in the. Uh, No, no, they would have had the whole thing. They would have had the whole thing because I mean I don't know how much because that's Old Testament. 